guys are Hansons. The fucking machine took my quarter. Who are you? Reg Dunlop, the coach. I knew there was some amount of product placement in the iconic 1977 George Roy Hill sports comedy, Slapshot, so I decided to check out just how much there actually was. To see what I'm talking about in this video, you'll have to bear with me for a couple of minutes. Only the precise details can help you begin to appreciate just how much placement there is and how subtly and artfully it is effectuated and why this is important. Only after showing the length and breadth of product placement will I be able to illustrate what I believe the advertiser was going for here, and it is an exceptionally clever, nearly breathtakingly well-executed plan of attack, a war on your eyeballs and taste buds that you aren't even aware is going on. The word ubiquitous wouldn't be out of place here. To be sure, seeing ads for Coca-Cola was already so much a part of the lives of Canadians and Americans in the course of an average day in 1977 or today. But the film might even seem less authentic if somehow there weren't quite so much product placement. To put this into some kind of larger context, worldwide, Coca-Cola spends around $4 billion per year on advertising, a lot of that on placement. As a global brand, they have determined that this is necessary to maintain their market share. And for over a hundred years, both foreign and domestic films have often included their product. Sometimes the placement is subtle, yet it occurs in a notable film, as when Patricia, played by Jean Seberg, drinks a Coke in Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, or in Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, when group captain Lionel Mandrake, Peter Sellers, orders Colonel Guano, Keenan Wynn, to shoot up a vending machine in a desperate attempt to gather enough loose change to call the White House. Colonel, that Coca-Cola machine, I want you to shoot the lock off it. There may be some change in there. You're going to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. Sometimes the placement is really prominent, as in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. I should mention here that I noticed an unexpected link between Blade Runner and Slapshot. Captain Bryant, the man who originally enlists the help of Rick Deckard, Harrison Ford, in retiring the four renegade Nexus 6 replicants, is played by none other than M. Emmett Walsh, Dickie Dunn in Slapshot. Drink some for me, up out. Anyway, the main point here is that although there is a long-established tradition of coke in films, George Roy Hill's comedy, as we'll see, takes this to an unprecedented level in terms of the sheer volume of product placement. Okay, so let's get started. The first time there is some Coca-Cola placement in Slapshot is during the first game played in the film against Hyannisport. Ironically, M. Emmett Walsh is actually in this scene. We see a container of Coke strategically placed between the two Charlestown media men, Dickey and Jim Carr, so we aren't immediately sure whose can it could be, though as the film progresses, we see Dickie Dunn as more of a coffee, or beer, or mixed drink man, rather than an exclusive devotee of the Atlanta-based soft drink manufacturer, as Jim Carr, Andrew Duncan, appears to be in this and several succeeding scenes. The next product placement is perhaps the most memorable in the film, in the bus station. The first time we lay eyes on the rugged and charismatic brothers, the Hansons, they are shown perfecting their body checking technique against a coke machine which unwisely decided to piss Steve off, taking his quarter without disgorging the desired bottle of soda. Eventually, Steve manages to recover his quarter, which shows the value of getting one last violent hit in on the machine. Soon after leaving the bus station, in the hallway of the hotel in which the Hansons are billeted, we see another, similar Coke machine. It turns out that Jack prefers orange or grape soda, most likely made by Fanta, which is another company owned and operated by the Coca-Cola Corporation as distinct from other non-Coca-Cola manufacturers. Okay, coach. Give me a grape and an orange, none of that stinking root beer. Please note that Jack is absolutely not referring to Bark's famous old-time root beer, which is another wholly owned subsidiary of the Coca-Cola Corporation. While on their first road trip of the film in Lancaster to play the Gears, we see that there is a Coke machine in the visitor's dressing room, and the television set sits on an inverted wooden Coca-Cola crate that looks a little like this. The next instance is back at home, in the dressing room, against the Long Island Ducks. This time it is bottles of Coke that are featured. The viewer will remember that this is the game that Ned Braden, Michael Ontkeen, characterizes as the garbage win, when Reggie deliberately throws Hanrahan off his game by disclosing that he knows of Hanrahan's marital difficulties and how profoundly troubled the goalie is regarding his wife's evolving sense of self. In this scene, Reggie seems so proud of himself that the Coke bottle seems more like a reward for a job well done than just a soft drink. 
We next see a Coke vending machine in the Charlestown dressing room behind Reggie as he is attempting to motivate his team to play a more physical and aggressive game. Examining the shot more closely, there is another yellowish Coke crate, this time right side up. A few minutes later, Jim Carr broadcasts the game against the Broome County Blades. Beside him is his trusty can of Coke. After this product placement, beside Jim Carr, it is 14 minutes until the next placement, during a road game against the Presidents. During the game in Hyannisport, after the Hansons go into the stands to find and punish the fan who threw the keychain at Jeff, afterwards, there are 24 Cokes, I believe we used to call this a flat of Coke, waiting for the team on a counter, and most of the players grab one. Jack Hansen is the first, followed by Steve. Jeff already has one in his right hand. Then Killer Carlson takes one. Please note the nearly perfect angle at which he holds it. Dave may be a mess, but he knows product placement. Then we have the piece de resistance. Steve is the first and only person in the film to actually appear to be drinking a Coke. Two others come very close. Reggie from a bottle, but at the last second he aborts. And Braden, later in this scene with the flat of Coke, he comes close to drinking it, but the beverage never quite makes it up to his mouth. This is an unusually Coke-heavy scene. At one point, Charlie, the team trainer, played by Matthew Cowles, is shown throwing a Coke to someone off camera. Also, Braden is seen walking around with it in his hand. We also have a brief shot where Jack and Steve are both shown sitting down with Cokes in their hands, though it's tougher to make out on account of the blood on their foil-covered knuckles. The thought occurs that a white font on a red background, or the opposite, is nearly an exact match for the color of blood on an ice surface. Perhaps this is another attempt, sublineal as it might be, to associate the product with the game, at least at that moment in the 1970s. Sometime later, in the Big King Drug Soda Fountain, we see what looks like either a refrigerator or more likely the dispenser out of which the staff pours out all those sodas. Either way, the machine is emblazoned with the logo and is hard to miss. As Reggie ventures outside, attempting to run into his soon-to-be ex-wife Francine, Jennifer Warren, we notice two more Coca-Cola signs, one illuminated and the other not. It is also noteworthy that in the drugstore, another player, André Bergeron, played by Jean Rosario Tetro, asks Reggie if he would like a Coke. Yeah, man, you want a Coke? Reggie declines because he's about to depart the soda fountain for a scheduled interview with Jim Carr, where he famously announces a $100 bounty on the head of Tim McCracken. André Bergeron, you'll remember, is the player we see removing his dentures prior to the game with the Lancaster Gears. The next appearance of a Coke is, predictably, with Jim Carr, again, during the Syracuse Bulldogs game, this time with a cup and a can. After this placement, there is about another 16 minutes until the next appearance of a Coca-Cola logo in Slapshot. This time, it is more subtle. There appears to be a garbage can with the Coke logo on it to the right of the inner door of the dressing room. This placement occurs during Reggie's old-time hockey epiphany when he decides that he wants to win the championship game without resort to either violence or intimidation, just old-time hockey. Violence is killing this sport. It's dragging it through the mud. There is a better angle on the Coke garbage can when Joe McGrath, Strother Martin, storms into the Charlestown dressing room between the first and second period to reprove his team for their lackluster and unaggressive play during the championship game. During McGrath's uncharacteristically emotional outburst, there, in the background, is the Coke machine making its penultimate appearance, closely followed by its final appearance around 10 seconds later, when Reggie gets up and moves across the dressing room. The last time we see the Coca-Cola logo is at the very end of the film and is the longest and perhaps most subtle placement. During the championship parade, as Francine drives out of Charlestown, and before Reggie departs for Minnesota to coach the Nighthawks franchise, we see another Coca-Cola sign on the upper right-hand side of the screen. Upon closer inspection, this is the Big King Drug Soda Fountain sign from earlier, just shown from a different angle. As we watch Francine's vehicle fade from view, the camera does not move and keeps returning to the same shot. The movie ends, but the parade continues on for a while. The Big King Drug Soda Fountain Coke sign ends up staying on screen for about another 15 seconds, which ends up being a billboard for Coke and one of the longer, essentially uninterrupted bits of product placement in this film. The amount of placement might have been a problem if it were not so subtly accomplished, although one might have thought that George Roy Hill and Paul Newman might still have been concerned about this. 
Yet it is possible that the producers felt that a sports comedy and the arena setting might be the perfect tie-in, since having a hot dog and a coke at a hockey game is not unknown, although enjoying a beer at a game probably occurs at least as frequently. It is a testament to the production itself that the placement is never obtrusive to the viewer. It is the compelling nature of the storytelling which keeps our focus on the characters. Beyond not interfering with the flow of the story, there is a clear strategy which informs the manner of the product placement. For example, despite a few shots of fans drinking beverages in the stands during games, it never seems to be a Coke. Usually it appears to be a beer. Why would this be? What is this choice about? It is as though Coca-Cola only wanted its product in front of our favorite protagonists and in settings where you would expect to see a Coke, dressing rooms and the like. Whether fans consume and enjoy their product may not matter so much. That is, if Reggie Dunlop drinks Coke, then we might like one too. Whereas the soda preference of an extra, on screen only for a second or two during the course of one of the games, may not have much value as far as product placement is concerned. But it goes further. The ostensible antagonists of the film, Tommy Hanrahan, Christopher Murney, Ogie Oglethorpe, Ned Dowd, Barkley Donaldson, Ross Smith, and Tim, Dr. Hook McCracken, Paul D'Amato, are not pictured anywhere near the product. Additionally, someone who spoils all the fun, say like Anita McCambridge, Catherine Walker, is never seen consuming a Coke. Enjoying Coca-Cola is a privilege reserved for three groups. Those individuals proactively attempting to save the team, players already on the Chiefs roster, and people who believe in and love Reggie Dunlop. In a sense, in Slapshot, Coca-Cola becomes associated with doing the right thing, being cool, and knowing how to comport yourself. The product placement is effective in another, perhaps unanticipated way as well. Because of Netflix and other streaming services, Slapshot in a sense, in addition to being a truly great movie which people continue to enjoy, has become, in some odd way if you look at it closely, an eternal ad for Coca-Cola starring none other than Paul Newman in and around the product, if not precisely endorsing it. Because of this, whatever Coca-Cola paid Universal Pictures for their product to be placed into Slapshot, it wasn't nearly enough. Thank you for watching and for your continuing interest in this channel. I am gratified that the viewers have enjoyed watching the Slapshot series of videos. Please consider subscribing to this channel if you enjoyed the work. Likes are also appreciated. Now you'll have to excuse me. For some reason I'm kind of parched. A delicious and refreshing Coca-Cola would really hit the spot right about now. I like to teach the world to sing, sing with me.